Welcome back, everyone. Hi, thanks for joining us. Let's see if this works any better than last time. Thank you for keeping your cameras on. Uh, it makes it much less lonely for me to look at you as opposed to look at myself. I, I see myself in the uh, gallery view too because of this weird um, Zoom hack that I'm using. Just to remind folks that haven't been with us the first time uh, on Tuesday, if anyone, if you'd like, so I'm not technically sharing a screen. Um, so if you'd like to see the slides in a sort of bigger format, you have to pin my little thumbnail. If you go to gallery view and then pin me, or maybe there's a little icon on the top right or something in the gallery view in the thumbnail. Um, if you pin me, then it will appear, uh, fill up your whole screen. So then you can see the slides better, okay? Um, all right, so the plan for today is, um, so first off, I wanted to uh, to get to know you a little bit and get you to know each other a little bit. And because of my bad time management on Tuesday, we didn't get to do that. We uh, I, we ran over already. Um, so I, I just want to sort of hear a little bit of, um, kind of you know, what your research interests are and, and um, why you're uh, taking this class or planning on taking this class so that I can think about how I can make the class more relevant for you. Um, and I'd like to hear your thoughts. Hopefully you've had a chance to browse through the two papers I, um, I, I recommended that you look at. Um, maybe we can discuss those a little bit. Uh, and then we have two main topics for today. Uh, we're gonna talk about sort of how to formulate research questions. And this is a harder step than it seems in general in, in any kind of study. And we're gonna talk about the role of theory. Um, how am I doing on mic volume and things like this? Is, can people see me and whatnot? Okay, and uh, standard rules like before, I have the chat window open, but I can't really see it, it's too small and too far away. So if you have something to say, uh, just interrupt me anytime and, and ask live. We're a small class, we can do that. We don't need um, uh, raising hands and things like that. All right, so let, let's start with the, the obvious, right? So who are you, what is your research and what would make this course valuable uh, to you? So maybe we could go around and just very briefly tell me if, uh, answers to these questions in any order. Yeah, I could go first. Um, my name is Jeremy. I am your student, Bogdan. Hi. Uh, <laughs> My, I've been doing research uh, primarily on improving the output of tools used by reverse engineers, uh, specifically decompilers. Um, one of the things I'm doing is improving uh, variable names. And one of the claims that I make is that variable names improve uh, people's use of these tools and make them easier to use. Um, I don't actually have too much evidence for this beyond uh, we name things what developers name things. So it would be super useful to be able to put together a reasonable human study and ask the right questions and uh, actually get some really good evidence that these things work. Cool, well, welcome. I, I think we're gonna cover uh, things that will be relevant for that. Uh, I can go next. So uh, hi, I am Sam. I am a, a fifth year master's student studying, starting this semester. I just graduated um, uh, from CMU uh, last semester. Yeah, and uh, I've been actually, I've been doing some, some research uh, uh, in my undergrad uh, with Bogdan. Uh, but yeah, so, so I, in, I think in general, my research interest is um, open source software and also engineering process. Uh, so how people make software. Um, and uh, for the fifth year master this year, I'm actually focusing on hackathons. Uh, work, I'm working with Jim Herbstep and I'm, I'm, I'm doing uh, some research on uh, basically analyzing the, uh, the people's perception of the outcomes of different types of hackathons like uh, scientific hackathons or corporate hackathons and maybe also comparing online versus offline hackathons because uh, now that we have more online hackathons. Um, so yeah, so so I think uh, what's really valuable about this course is um, so I've been doing some a uh, little bit of research in, in undergrad, uh, but I never really had a chance to um, to really systematically learn about different research um, methods, different different approach to uh, um, to more scientifically analyze, uh, collect data, and analyze the data to to come come to some uh, reasonable conclusion. Yeah. 
Well, thank you. Welcome, welcome to the class. I, I think we're going to have material that you will find useful uh, as well. So yeah, that sounds good. Thank you. Okay, I can go next. Uh, hello, everyone. My name was Hongbo. I'm a second PhD, second year PhD in societal computing, and I'm a Bogdan student. Uh, and basically, my research was uh, study social network and online collaboration, like how information flow on social media, like Twitter, or that what makes people collaborate better uh, on, for example, software engineering platforms like uh, GitHub. Mm -hmm. And so what makes this course valuable? Uh, so my research do both qualitative and quantitative research. And I think a lot of the uh, materials covered in this class will be very relevant to my research mm -hmm. topic. And also I got recommended from someone saying that it's relevant. So far, it sounds just like I'm forcing my students to take this class. <laughs> no, we voluntarily take this class. Volunteered. Right. Th thank you. Thank you, Bobo. Okay. I can go next. I'm Jenna. Um, I am a fourth year PhD student in software engineering and ISR. I am not Bogdan student, <laughs> although I thought about it a while ago. <laughs> I am uh, Jonathan Aldrich and Josh Sunshine are my advisors, if you know them. And I do research in uh, what we call gradual verification, which is combining static and dynamic verification techniques to try to make um, both of them more usable. And so we kind of built this ground theory and I'm prototyping a tool in, in um, gradual verification or gradual verifier. And so what we wanna find out is this incrementality that it allows people to do in verification, is that actually like helpful to people? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like can they, we, we posit that it will be, but um, we don't know if it will improve like the education of verification, which is one of our goals at all. Well, we have like a lot of other research questions that I can't think of off the top of my head, but I will probably talk a lot about as we work on the project. Um, but I think what's valuable is actually exploring how um, the techniques we've developed and the kind of theories that we have with how our technique will help other people. How, does that actually like, is that true in practice? And I'm also kind of interested, this is kind of a tangent to my research, but I've been thinking about it because eventually I have to kind of like go beyond just my thesis research is uh, the usability of formal verification and writing specifications. Like <laughs> I would be kind of cool to explore more about how people write specifications and like what are they getting tripped up on and stuff like that. So I think this course will be really valuable for all of those things. Thank you, Jenna. That's that's great. I'm, I'm really glad to to hear about your profile because I think it's sort of um, it's not the obvious profile of, of somebody taking empirical methods because you're sort of not doing empirical research on a daily basis, but it, it, it is the obvious profile of somebody sort of needing uh, some empirical component as part of their uh, research in whatever other area. So yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, I can go next. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, thanks. Um, so I'm Kyle. I'm a second year PhD student. I'm working with Jonathan Aldrich. And my research is on trying to make IoT programming easier for um, non-specialist programmers. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of how this course applies to me is since we want to work, we want to make sure that the language um, is usable and also um, actually um, like non-specialists can actually use the language. Um, we, I think like it's important to have like that human aspect in, in the research to show um, to show that um, we can have the language actually work. Um, so I think it's a little bit ambiguous in how uh, to do this in like a rigorous fashion. So I think um, this course would help me in terms of that. It sounds great, Kyle. Thank you. Welcome to the class. Uh, I, can, I can go next. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Simon. Uh, I'm a first year PhD student. Uh, so my research uh, focuses uh, like on formal method. So specifically, how to improve uh, safety and reliability of, you know, cyber physical systems and self adaptive systems using formal method. 
uh, we explore uh, logics uh, such as a signal temporal logic, uh, and uh, we're just building some prototype and framework. Uh, so right now my research is mostly uh, qualitative, uh, but one, one of the challenges is like, how do we verify if our approach works? Like how do we evaluate um, the result we get from our tools, our prototypes uh, to prove like this actually works. Uh, so that's the main thing I really wanna get out from this. Uh, class and another thing is just to learn about research because um, I'm still at like a starting point. Yeah, sounds great. Thank you. Welcome, welcome, Sam. Yeah, thank you. So I, I think I can go next. So my name is CJ. Uh, I work with uh, David Garland and News.com. So I work on formal methods, uh, software architecture, and software quality. So basically, uh, in our group, we kind of build uh, build models of software and, and use like formal verification, like reasoning to, to read the system properties. So for this course, like uh, I think my situation is similar uh, to like Jenna and, Jenna's and Simon's. Like we we do some like proving and verification, but we are not kind of pure like mathematics that that just do some math. So. So because we are in the SE community, we, we, we still kind of have to reason that the, the problem exists and the problem and our tool is kind of is practical for, for developers. Mm -hmm. I think in this course, we like, so I like to kind of learn this kind of empirical method that can evaluate our like tools or our, our methods. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, CJ. I can go next. Uh, so I'm Frank. Uh, so I'm probably the only one here that's not from uh, I, I, ISR, I guess. Uh, I'm from I'm a PhD student, uh, like from LTI, and uh, I also work with Bogdan on, like, uh, and Graham Newbig on like natural language and code generation that kind of stuff. So uh, like basically, my research is try to transform like natural language queries into executable. Uh, computer programs. Mm -hmm. So um, so the reason why I'm taking this course is that last year I was working on a user study that actually deploys a prototype, a natural language to code generation tool. And we, um, we do a lot of analysis like from uh, user study uh, experiments, uh, all sorts of signals. So uh, I think I'm kind of lacking this kind of um, ability to 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 dig some useful information out of a lot of uh, user study data. So I think this course is a great fit for me. And so that's that's great. Thank you, Frank, welcome. Yeah, I'm actually gonna pick on your research in a little bit in, in lecture today, but yeah, thanks, thanks for joining us. Uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> thanks. Um, I'm Austin Wisnant. I work for the Software Engineering Institute here at CMU. I'm also a PhD student in engineering and public policy. Um, my research interest is in cybersecurity policy, mainly on the national defense side. Um, I'm taking this course because I've never really had a research methods type of course. So just looking to get kind of the, the general methods out of it. It's awesome. Thank you for joining us. May I have your name again? I, I haven't had a chance to meet you before, so I, I couldn't get it the first time. It's Austin, wasn't it? Okay, right. Austin, welcome. Yep. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Hana. I am currently a research associate working with uh, Laura Dabish in HCI and also Jim Herbstleb in Bogdan. And uh, I'm hopefully uh, an incoming PhD student this fall. And my research is currently on diversity and inclusion in open source. So um, understanding the differences in careers between men, women, trans and non-binary individuals and how that affects their careers. And um, yeah, I'm interested in this course because, you know, I'm hoping to start my PhD. So this is like a perfect, you know, way to get sort of um, a, like a little view of different types of research. And um, I've pretty much just been doing qualitative work. So I'm interested in mixed methods and also quantitative. And uh, yeah, so hopefully to learn a lot in this class. Welcome, Hannah. There's going to be lots of quantitative stuff um, in, in the class. So hopefully you'll find that useful. 
Anyone um, else? Yes, I can go next. Um, so I am a first year PhD student advised by Rohan and Ansak. Um, similar to Simon, I'm interested in uh, like kind of safety assurance in cyber physical systems. Uh, I did my RU kind of in, in that area. Um, and from that research, I got more interested in like evaluating the systems that exist. Um, and I think a lot of research in this area is kind of missing an empirical component. And I'm looking to learn more about empirical research so I can help fill that gap. Welcome, Ben. Oh, hello, I can go next. Um... Okay, can you all hear me? Uh, I'm Joshua. Uh, I'm under Dr. Kathleen Carley. I'm a third year PhD student and my research interests are um, digital disinformation and hate speech in social in online social networks. So uh, I'm, I'm interested in the course because uh, I think in our lab, we tend to use a lot of social network analysis, which is, which is great for the kind of problems we use. But I also feel like I want to be exposed to other kinds of methodologies um, that that we don't get exposed to it that way, especially since I'm finding that some of the questions I want to answer start to incorporate these other methods. And I've just been kind of bootstrap, bootstrapping my education in those methods um, through like reading by myself. So formal introduction would be really great. Mm. Yeah, so have I, uh, and I'm sure lots of others as we have kind of gotten into these things. Uh, so I'm, that's why I'm so happy to be able to offer this class. Thanks for taking it. And, and welcome. Okay, am I the last one? Sure, please. So hi, my name is Jay Yun, and I think I'm an outlier in this class. Um, I'm a master's student in uh, information systems management, and I have many years of um, professional experience. From, so I started in public accounting for three years in tax and audit. Then I switched to m a for three years. And then I evidenced that while working in professional um, I mean, industry, I saw that there was a lot, a huge shift towards like IT text analysis and a lot of advancements in the accounting and the finance um, area. So I thought it would be interesting to switch to academia to look further into this more, more from the a macroeconomic side. Mm -hmm. So I'm like a super beginner here and I thought that a proper, proper introduction to um, empirical methods would be beneficial for me in the future mm -hmm. since I plan to apply to PhD programs. So I hope to learn a lot from this course. Well, excellent. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you being here. Uh, it's, it's great. To, we don't usually get a lot of students from, from outside of computer science. So it's great to see you. Thank you. Do you, we have anyone else? With that, then uh, welcome again to, to all of you. So let's move on and talk a little bit about the, the readings. So I'm gonna ask for a volunteer. If anybody had a chance to skim the two papers I mentioned, I don't wanna spend a lot of time on this, but I, I do wanna sort of um, make sure that you, you got the same impression by um, by reading them or browsing them that I, uh, that I was hoping you would. So there were two papers assigned. They were so roughly on the same topic, um, th this topic of um, dependencies and, and sort of a software engineering sense, uh, using libraries and so on downstream and kind of the dependencies that that introduces. And so how, um, um, if anything changes in one of these libraries that somebody's using downstream, uh, that sort of affects them because they're uh, whatever they've they've done, uh, what, whatever they've built on top of that library may not work anymore uh, uh, as intended because of these changes that have happened. So this is sort of a big problem in software engineering. The problem per se is maybe less uh, uh, important, and the technical software engineering details of this are less important. So I, I, I mentioned this last uh, class that you know even though a lot of the readings in this class are so software engineering papers, this is not a software engineering class. I, at least I'm. I'm not uh, trying to make it a software engineering class. Um, it's un unintentionally perhaps a software engineering class, but it's not designed to be a software engineering class. I I'm hoping that you sort of read through, uh, read through the software engineering technical details of these things and sort of focus on the bigger picture and the higher level study design uh, uh, 
type questions. So I want to ask, um, first of all, what was the point of this paper? Is this, somebody that has looked at this, uh, what was the point of this? And what methodology and what uh, research questions were they asking? What methodology uh, were they using in order to, to answer them? And, and why? Why did they do that? So can somebody just summarize this for us quick? There's no right or wrong answer. So, you know, just any thoughts uh, you have on this uh, are fine. Assuming you've had a chance to look at this. Uh, yeah, so I can take a shot at it. So um, this paper was looking at uh, three communities, three different developer communities in order to get an idea of the different ways they react to change and how their community values and policies influence that. And um, so it was a more of a qualitative study and they use semi-structured um, interviews. They also did a validity check, which was interesting. And uh, yeah, basically they were looking, you know, between the different communities amongst the developers, was there some sort of consensus with how they approach change, um, how they viewed like the cause versus speed, um, what, you know, how they dealt with sort of dependencies and uh, bugs. And also um, I think like a big issue was uh, technical debt as well, which was interesting because the researchers hadn't really in, you know, hadn't really thought of it. So it was interesting that that came up just from the interviews. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so basically getting these quotes from, you know, interviewing these developers and getting the consensus gave a lot of detail and sort of helped formulate um, a theory on like, what are the different communities, what they value more, how they re like react um, to change. And um, yeah, I think that was pretty much it. So there's a lot in there. So let me, let me, uh probe a little bit. Um, you said they, um, they asked some very broad questions. Um, and you said they chose to answer them using some qualitative methods. They, they chose a particular type of interviewing technique. We're going to talk more about that uh, next week, I think. Uh, but wh why was this um, sort of an appropriate choice of method given the questions they were asking? Like, why was this a good idea? Or, or was it? Um, for me personally, I would say it's a good idea. Just, um, yeah, because they sort of split it up by, they want to know about the sort of community values for each of these um, uh, communities and there's ecosystems. And really the best way to get that is to talk to the people in the community. And that's how you, you know, just hearing about what they value and um, how they sort of act and also what their policies were, um, gives you a better idea detail as they can go into more detail about maybe some of the history, why they you know, decide as a group to work like this. And uh, yeah, just those sort of qualitative interviews go into a little bit more detail on their personal experience, um, which is I think very valid and relevant for this sort of study. Mm -hmm. How much was known about this particular problem or a set of problems that they were looking at before they did this study? What would you say? Was this sort of a, like a solved problem or was it some sort of new phenomenon or somewhere in between? Um, I skimmed the background, but what I sort of understood was um, they had seen a little bit of this before and they were so, yeah, so they were more interested in like um, the how and why and so getting into more detail and formulating a bit more of a theory. Mm -hmm. At least, yeah, that's what I got, but I, I skimmed the background part. There was something else you, you mentioned. You said they looked at sort of three communities. Like, why three? Why not just one? Or why not 20? Or why not 300? Like, wh where does this, wh why was it useful or necessary to look at more than one community? Um, yeah, so definitely, yeah. One probably wouldn't be good because they're interested in um, comparing the reactions to change in different ecosystems. So the whole point is how do they, um, yeah, what are their, how do their responses differ? And as far as, you know, why, so I think they did, they did node of R and I forgot what the other one, the other community was, but those are all very sort of popular, lots of developers to talk to. Mm -hmm. And, um, but yeah, I think going like, maybe they could have gone up to five, but yeah, just interviewing takes a lot of time. So there's definitely a bottleneck of, you know, transcribing, talking to people, talking to different interviewers. So yeah, I think three is appropriate. I, I guess I'm getting at um, 
uh, the core of my question is sort of why, why more than one? Why why isn't one community sufficient? Like why do you sort of have to compare or or sort of study different communities? Like is there any value or benefit or need for doing this? Anybody? So, so I'd like to add on that. So I think like they are, before they did this interview thing, I think they already have some assumption about that the different communities have different way to 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 kind of handle the the, uh, the breaking changes in in the in the code. So they kind of they intentionally pick three, and like what like for the Eclipse one, they already know that in the Eclipse community, they kind of they are they are more like kind of uh, cautious on making changes, but in NPM community, they, they kind of making changes every day. So they already have this assumption and kind of knowledge. Mm -hmm. And then that's why they kind of pick this three community. Mm -hmm. yeah. right, right, thank you. Yeah, so I guess it's, it's a, it was a very deliberate decision to pick more than one community um, because they had some, some hypotheses, some assumptions about how um, this phenomenon they were studying sort of manifests itself differently in different communities. And so they, they wanted to have some data to, uh, collected from these different communities to be able to compare that, to be able to understand sort of how um, these um, sort of community specific aspects impact this phenomenon that they were studying. Uh, and you know, there's no magic number, right? So they could have done five, they could have done 20, but they sort of they chose three that were somehow meaningfully and interestingly different. It's not about the number here. There's no magic number of, of, sort of things to study, um, but they sort of had some very valid reason for, for sort of choosing more than one and for choosing these ones in particular as sort of illustrative of those differences they were trying to highlight as part of their design. Um, okay. Um, wh what about this other one? This one's also about breaking changes essentially, but um, like, you probably agree it's a very different flavor. And what's what's the flavor in this uh, Raymacher's paper compared to um, the, the Bogart's paper? Uh, anybody that has had a chance to, to browse this? Uh, so I, I kind of briefly skimmed it um, before class, but uh, the flavor of research questions in particular and then the techniques that they used are very like, they're looking for like objective trends and they want to like show what trends there are in a particular Maven repository um, or in Maven Central. Um, so they're they're just, it seems very like they're, they're not trying to get context. They're not trying to understand the how and the why of why things are done. They're just trying to see like what kind of uh, trends. I mean, they even talk about specific trends they're looking to prove or disprove exist, but it really feels like they're just trying to prove or disprove spe very specific hypotheses about um, breaking changes, but like it, with respect to Maven in particular. Mm -hmm. And so in doing so, they can use very, I would say quantitative techniques, <laughs> since they're, they're analyzing very different aspects of the repository uh, that are quantitative. So I think um, they look at like very, uh, I didn't look at all the details because there's they, you, they look at a lot of different things, but like string patterns, I think I read one where they even look at the AST of the source language of some code and they compare them in like very different quantitative measures. That, that's okay. I explicitly didn't ask uh, people to uh, read these carefully. I, I, I think I. Didn't... Yeah, I was. I wanted to focus on like, not direct, like exactly the techniques that they're using because they use a few to. But it, when you just kind of skim it, you can see that they're very quantitative measures of aspects of the repository that they're like comparing and measuring, mm -hmm. and they're using that to to answer their research questions. Do you, do you trust their conclusions or their findings? And, and why, why do you or why don't you? So I think I do. Of course, I probably would spend more time reading the actual measures that they come up with <laughs> before making that uh, saying, I, exactly saying that I trust it. But presumably, they picked good measures and applied it properly. 
um, in a proper quantitative manner. But so in doing so, I would say if they did those things, I would definitely say that I trust them because they've scoped their research questions appropriately um, so that the quantitative data will actually answer them. I feel like if they were trying to make more grander claims, I think maybe even some of the similar to the research questions in the other paper, I wouldn't believe them. Um, I think that I only trust it because I think they've scoped their research questions appropriately to the, the quantitative measures that they're using. Mm -hmm. And at, at least on the surface, so the measures uh, seem uh, reasonable or appropriate. Uh, yeah. Um, I did like the AST thing that they were doing, which is why it caught my eye. <laughs> Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Thank you. So I guess um, what I'm trying to show with this, uh, with this comparison, is two very different, arguably fundamentally different styles of research papers that are working on essentially the same problem. So the, the Bogart paper uh, took a very sort of broad view um, and tried to sort of um, collect bottom up some challenges that people were, were facing and so on, and so document some practices that were maybe interestingly different between different communities that practitioners had, uh, but it was sort of bottom up. They they had maybe some assumptions going in, but they didn't really know kind of what to expect, and so they, they bottom up tried to build this understanding of the phenomenon they were they were studying, and the the Raymarkers paper is. Uh, arguably exactly the opposite uh, in, in the sense that they they had a very narrow, very specific, very uh, sort of clearly uh, measurable and operationalizable uh, set of phenomena or, or practices or, or things um, that they were interested in. Um, and they uh, sort of developed measures for those and so on. And they collected lots of data and they report on sort of um, these general patterns and trends across a large um, repository of data or a large corpus of data and so they um, in some sense they sort of uh, had this um, hypothesis and, and sort of theory going in or uh, they, they knew exactly what they were looking for they were looking for some very specific ph phenomena and patterns and they just went to collect evidence of the existence of those patterns among other things okay so very different styles of sort of working on the same problem um, I, I don't have, uh, there's no value judgment uh, associated with, with any of these, certainly not from me. Um, they're, they're perfectly uh, valid and, and reasonable. As you, you know, Steve, I haven't, uh, I haven't gone over the technical details here to, to have an opinion on, on that, but um, assuming they don't make any obvious sort of uh, methodological mistakes, these are both sort of perfectly reasonable, valid, examples of sort of how to study a problem in sort of fundamentally different ways. And I'm going to argue that the, um, the one of the sort of important distinctions uh, or sort of one of the important factors for determining which of these styles or something else altogether or something in between um, to choose, and we talked about this a little bit uh, on Tuesday already, uh, is um, so the state of knowledge on the one hand, how much do we know about a particular phenomenon? Are we confident enough that we understand the particular problem well enough to be able to sort of study very specific aspects of it? Or are we just trying to, to develop some general understanding of some particular phenomenon first? And so sort of de then we could follow up with more sort of specific things uh, and so on. So you'll see this recurring theme throughout um, a lot of empirical research in, in general and also a lot, uh, a lot of what we're going to talk about uh, today. So let me move on to um, kind of one of the key parts of, um, of, of any uh, research study, this is not about an empirical research study, this is again, um, I, I mentioned this and I'm going to keep mentioning this throughout the semester, this is not a software engineering class, it's not even a computer science class necessarily, it's sort of a science class more than, more than anything, uh, I hope, at least that's my intention. Um, so formulating research questions is something that happens in any, any uh, research study, uh, irrespective of, of uh, domain or discipline and so on. So let's talk about this a little bit. So here are some, uh, some people that you should meet. So this is Jane. Uh, Jane um, has this intuition. She's a PhD student and she has this intuition that uh, the fisheye view file navigator, uh, something that sort of looks like, uh, like the image here, um, is more efficient for file navigation than a traditional file navigator. Um, and uh, this is because file navigation requires a lot of scrolling and a lot of clicking. And uh, by distorting uh, the uh, sort of visualization in this way, by sort of making things that are farther away um, 
from the, the thing that you're focused on, making them smaller. Um, she has the intuition that this will sort of reduce the amount of scrolling required as you're kind of navigating through your file tree because things are just so sort of smaller and you can sort of uh, reduce the amount of scrolling needed to get to other parts of the file tree. Okay, so this is her, uh, uh, her sort of research topic. Um, and um, this seems reasonable, right? Seems like uh, it might work, but uh, also uh, people might object to this. Uh, critics might argue that, well, I mean, it's, it's difficult to read. You really, you really can't see any of the small uh, print there on, on the uh, uh, on the navigator, uh, and also it's just so weird, right? So like, you know, people might just not adopt this. It's so like unconventional, like it's never going to work in practice, even if it's sort of a good research idea. So. Jane wants to collect evidence that either supports or refutes her intuition that, that, this, um, that using a fisheye view file navigator is more efficient for file navigation than a sort of traditional one. Okay, so this was Jane. Um, here's Joe. Joe um, is interested in how developers in industry are using or not um, UML design diagrams during software design. It's a particular type of, uh, of design uh, diagram uh, that, um, that uh, people learn in, in school. Uh, I, uh, as part of a, a class that I teach on occasion 214, we also teach our students to sort of um, use UML diagrams and, and sort of design software using UML. Uh, so this is sort of something that a lot of academics uh, teach or, or recommend. But you know, Joe went uh, and interned at Evil Core over the summer, and uh, his experience there indicates that UML is uh, rarely, if ever, used in practice. So Joe is interested in uh, exploring how widely used these kind of diagrams are in in industry. Are they just sort of this academic gim gimmick, or are they something that's actually so useful in practice? Um, and more specifically, he's interested in how these diagrams are used uh, as part of collaborative, um, as part of collaboration, uh, collaborative software design. So how do people collaborate on software design in industry using these kind of diagrams? How do they use them as part of the design process? So that's Joe's research goal. Um, so both Jane and Joe have sort of some arguably clear problems they're working on. Um, and you know you, you could imagine them asking the following research questions. Like uh, for example, Jane might ask, "Is fish is a fisheye file sorry fisheye view file navigator more efficient than the traditional view for file navigation?" Right. This could be a, sort of a research question, specific research question that, that Jane would ask. Uh, Joe might ask, "How widely used are UML diagrams um, as collaborative shared artifacts during the software design process?" Uh, kind of following up on his on his research goal. Okay, so any thoughts on these? Kind of how do these sound like uh, these uh, research questions as formulated? Um, I'm wondering what efficient means in mm. Jane's question. Uh, efficient can have a ton of different meanings, and it seems poorly defined here. Mm -hmm. So some ambiguity there, some vagueness. What else? It's it's fair game. There's no right or wrong answer. Just <laughs> tell me what you're thinking. If I mean, think similarly, like with Joe's question, what does widely mean? What's your level of granularity here? Um, mm -hmm. Maybe they're not widely used in every company or maybe they're used in one company and it's got a ton of users so i don't know so i guess your what will joe accept as an answer is your your criticism that i i think that's a good summary yeah mm -hmm. anyone else right i i mean this is just an observation but uh, uh it seems like jane's question is more uh narrow whereas joe's question is more open-ended mm. Yes, I, I agree with this. What else? What else do, do comes to mind as you're seeing these?
So I'm going to argue that the most obvious question, and you know, perhaps the two examples I gave um, on the previous slide were maybe the most obvious questions given the research goals that Jane and Joe uh, both had. I'm going to argue that the most obvious question is not always the best choice uh, for a starting point in a, in a research study or a research project or a PhD, if you will. Um, so let's, let's dissect Jane's a little bit more. Um, so for example, like, do we already know that some people need to do file navigation at all? And who are these people? And when do they need to do file navigation? Or sort of what's, what's the context there? And what's the, the population of, of uh, interest here? Like, who is being affected by this and interested in file navigation? Um, what does it even mean exactly to do file navigation? Like, is you know, like what is and isn't file navigation? Is um, scrolling and clicking once but not twice file navigation? Is sort of opening a, a file file navigation, or is, is going to a folder file navigation and so on? Is like book, bookmarking something file navigation? Like, what what exactly is file navigation? Okay. Um, when do people do file navigation? Under what circumstances? Are they trying to uh, complete some task? Are they working on something in particular? Are they, uh, you know, when does this come up? When do they need to do this? Um, what is efficiency? I, I think Jeremy already mentioned this. Uh, and uh, you know, how do you measure efficiency? But even like e even broader, like is efficiency a relevant goal for these people that have to do file navigation? Like may, maybe something else, maybe building a shared understanding of the artifacts or something else, right? maybe something else is a primary goal. Maybe efficiency is, is not even their primary goal, right? So like wh why, uh, you know, why is this even worth uh, improving is, if it's not something that they actually care about, okay? And, and so on and so forth, right? So these are just some examples of, of sort of questions that, uh, you know, Jane could have thought more uh, about before uh, phrasing, formulating her, her research question, her specific research question. Let's look at Joe's for a second. Uh, one second, I have a question. So like, what if like your first in instinct is the question that Jane comes up with? Can you then like do what you're doing? Like, is it okay to like start with this question and then more... like do what you're doing and expand upon it, right? <laughs> There's no other way. Yes, yeah, so you start okay. with the first thing that comes to mind, uh, and then you sort of take a step back and you try to uh, critically think about it, and uh, and then you sort of um, uh, refine it uh, and expand it and break it down into multiple things and so on and so forth, until you're sort of happy that you've thought about uh, kind of uh, all of these complications and and sort of new ones. Okay, but that makes me feel better because I I literally came up with a question almost exactly like Jane's. <laughs> I guess I should have asked people to do this as an activity. I'll do that next time. Thank you for the suggestion. If you uh, articulate to phrase a research question and so see how far off uh, people are from uh, from the example here. No, but you're absolutely right, uh, Jenna. There's no other way but to to start with the most obvious thing and so then think about it critically. But let's walk through the same uh, exercise with uh, with Joe's question. Joe's asking, how widely are these diagrams used as a collaborative shared artifact during the software design process? So same type of, sort of definition criticisms here, like what's a collaborative shared artifact and what isn't? What counts as a, a collaborative shared artifact? Um, can, can we reliably identify one? Like, do we know how to find them if we're looking for them, or do we just know to recognize one when we see it? So is this something that's operationalizable, measurable? Do we know what these things are? Um, can we you know, reliably say which things are and aren't UML diagrams? So there's some very specific so syntax that uh, is, is so part of the official UML notation and so on. It's like, you know, what if you tweak that a little bit? What if you omit some of the uh, things that are part of the official notation? Like, is that still a UML diagram? Is it not a UML diagram? So like, what's the, the scope of things that you considered uh, UML diagrams here? And so how far, um, that's what's, what's the, the scope of your uh, research question there for your research? Like how far um, does that reach? Sorry, I pressed the wrong button. Um, so the point of this is the, to, to show some ways in which both questions were vague uh, as phrased originally, uh, because they either made assumptions about the phenomena to be studied, 
uh, or they made assumptions about the kinds of situations in which the phenomena occur, or they made other assumptions, um, and they never articulated and documented what those assumptions were. Okay, so with something like this, it's very hard to, um, to know what you will accept as an answer. If the, if the question you're asking is um, ill-specified, it's very hard to know when you've found an answer to it. Right? It's only if your question is very, very clear that you can start reasoning about wh whether you've answered it or not. Otherwise, you just you have no idea whether you've answered it or not. Um, so here are some uh, possible, arguably better questions that Jane and Joe could have asked instead. So for example, they could have asked exploratory style questions, um, questions about the existence of some phenomenon. So Jane could have asked, is file navigation something that certain kinds of programmers actually do? Like, do people actually do this as part of their, their, their jobs or their work? Um, or is efficiency actually a problem? Does anybody care about efficiency in file navigation? Maybe there's other problems that are more important in file navigation. Maybe efficiency is not one of them. Um, Joe could have asked, for example, do collaborative shared artifacts actually exist? Like, does anybody actually sort of collaborate, uh, share artifacts while they're collaborating uh, on, on, soft, on the software design process? Do people even collaborate while they're designing software? Is that a collaborative process? Do they share artifacts when they're doing this? So questions that um, try to get at the existence of this uh, thing you're, you're interested in studying. Um, they could have asked description and classification questions. Uh, so for example, Jane could have asked, how can we measure efficiency for file navigation? Like describing what efficiency means in, in file navigation. Um, Joe could have asked, what are all the types of collaborative shared artifacts out there so that, you know, so that we know what's in scope and out of scope when we're studying how people um, share these during software design? Like what's, what's the universe of collaborative shared artifacts? Um, similarly, they could have asked some descriptive comparative questions. Like how do fisheye views differ from conventional views? Like what are the fundamental differences between these two kinds of views? Like they both show files, so that's not a difference, but so what's fundamentally different about them? Um, or Joe could have asked, how do UML diagrams differ from other representations of design information? Maybe people do sketches on the whiteboard and whatnot. Like what's, what's so fundamentally different about UML diagrams? Um, compared to other kinds of, of design information so that we focus on studying UML diagrams and not other kinds of design information. Okay. So you can see that the outcomes here um, are just developing a clear understanding of the phenomena you're studying and your more precise definitions of the theoretical terms and of the concepts, evidence that you can measure them, evidence that the measures are valid, evidence that the problem exists and so on. So this is sort of the outcome uh, the tip, some range of possible outcomes for this style of exploratory questions. Um, alternatively, they could have asked um, base rate questions, questions that uh, get at the normal patterns of occurrence of phenomenon. Right? If you don't know what is a normal pattern of occurrence, you cannot reason about sort of abnormality and, and patterns of occurrence. So you have to establish what normality means before you can, you can start reasoning about something being abnormal and potentially problematic, right? M maybe it's perfectly normal that people uh, don't uh, share artifacts during the software design process and there's no need to, um, to, to force them to do that. Maybe the, the normal is that people don't, don't do that. Um, so types of uh, base rate questions, for example, um, questions that get at frequency and distributions of, of things, how many different UML diagrams are created in, uh, during software development uh, in large companies? Um, the Raymakers questions from earlier, the, one of the papers we talked about earlier was, was one of this style of questions, like how many of these uh, the, whatever patterns of uh, semantic versioning or, or whatever they were looking at, how many of these things actually occur? So that's sort of a frequency of distribution uh, style question. Um, or they could be descriptive referring to the process. Like how, what's, what's, the what's the process that people follow, programmers follow 
to navigate files using existing tools before we start thinking about developing new tools. What, is the, what does that process look like? Can we describe it and document it of file navigation? Um, and, and these type of questions give you the basis for, uh, we talked about this, for, for saying whether something is sort of normal or, or unusual uh, and so, uh, they allow you to kind of focus the next stage of your research that has to do with uh, probably trying to solve some of these problems that you detect. Um, there's also relationship questions, yet another kind. So for example, Jane could ask, does efficiency in file navigation correlate with the programmer's familiarity with the programming environment? Essentially, you know, do, are, are, are people more efficient when they're more experienced, are, pro are more experienced programmers more efficient at file navigation? Is there a correlation between those? Um, Joe could have asked if um, the manager's claims about how often they use UML actually correlate with uh, actual uses of, of UML. Like are, are managers just daydreaming or inventing these things? Or are they making up alternative facts? Or how often does this thing actually uh, occur in, in practice, or can we study the correlation between perception and reality? Um, and this is actually really useful, establishing the occurrence, uh, establishing that the occurrence of some phenomenon is related to the occurrence of another, is the basis for so subsequent causal analysis and, and, and other things. So this is very, very useful to, to have this um, evidence of this relationship. Um, You've guessed it, causality questions are the next obvious type of question. Um, do fisheye views cause an improvement in efficiency for file navigation um, is a kind of question that uh, Jane would ask of this nature. Um, do fisheye views ca cause programmers to be more efficient at file navigation than conventional views? This is a sort of causality comparative question. The first one is just, just abstractly, um, sorry, absolutely, uh, uh, you're, you're answering this in absolute terms. Do they cause an improvement uh, or not? Second one is, do they cause more of an improvement than something that exists already or something that's easier to use or you know, whatever, whatever that may be. But these are examples of causality questions. Um, do these views cause programmers to be more efficient at fa file navigation than conventional views when programmers are distracted, but not otherwise. So kind of how do you, um, like what, what are the other variables that sort of interact uh, with, with um, efficiency here? And so and under what conditions do, does that causal relationship hold or uh, does it become stronger or weaker? Kind of what are the, the mediators and, and moderators here? Um, um, and the outcomes are so explaining um, why a uh, relationship holds. Um, ideally, ideally you would explain why it holds, not just to establish that it holds, um, by identifying a cause and effect and sort of reasoning about the, the mechanisms um, behind them. And you can also think about um, how context affects this cause and effect relationship, right? So this was the uh, sort of distraction uh, argument from, from before. Finally, uh, and I think this gets at the, the research that a lot of you um, have been doing already, um, you can ask design style questions. Um, okay, so for example, what is an effective way for teams to represent design knowledge to improve coordination is a question that uh, Joe might ask and that this would so lead him to building some tools, some formalism, some process, some new programming language, some whatever, so building something, um, designing and building something to, to address this issue. So this is, I think, a kind of, of, of question that comes up a lot in a, a lot of your uh, research. Um, and um, the outcomes here are you know, designing these tools and, and uh, implementing them and evaluating them and so on. Um, for, for carrying out some activity, um, or they could be broader, they could be sort of more uh, societal or, or regulatory in nature, it could be designing policy or designing sort of bigger things like that. But these are sort of uh, all kind of lumped into this uh, category of design questions. Um, so 
I guess so stepping back for, for a second, the, the point of all of this is that um, it's very likely that a long-term research program um, in any applied discipline, uh, software engineering is a good example of an applied discipline or an engineering discipline, but really any applied discipline, uh, this is again, not computer science specific. Um, it's likely that uh, this will involve a mix of both knowledge style questions and design style questions, right? So like typically uh, you would start by understanding a problem better and these are the sort of the knowledge style questions that we talked about before. Uh, everything about design is, is uh, labeled here knowledge style question. Um, but once you have a good understanding of a problem, like you will likely want to try to uh, intervene and solve it somehow. So you'll you know, design some intervention of sorts. Uh, and this is how it's likely that your research will, will evolve from sort of more understanding of a phenomenon or a problem to more of designing a solution or an intervention. So uh, these all, the point is these all have their place in, in research in general. Um, there's no, so there's no right or wrong uh, question to ask here, um, but, but there's a probably more relevant and applicable at, at different stages of, of research and so different stages of knowledge about a particular problem. Let me pause here for a second, just to kind of hear your thoughts on this before I, uh, I move on. And No more focus. Cool. Well, blurry is fine too. Th thoughts on research questions from the discussion so far? I guess I have a question about, um, I feel like this thought process creates a lot of research questions you could tackle. What if you're interested, like how, how much do you tackle versus how much do you rely on like related work to tackle? Uh, so that you can answer maybe the questions that you want, or maybe what if there isn't any related work to kind of answer your question? Do you have to go out and do it even though you want to answer this other question? Mm -hmm. I, uh, yeah, that's what came to mind when we were just going through this. <laughs> my take on this, you should rely as much as you can on um, related work and the work of others and, and the literature to not um, redo any of the stuff that we already have answers for, unless your goal is explicitly that, unless you're sort of explicitly trying to, to sort of challenge some known, uh, I don't know, a piece of knowledge or result or study. So you, you think that um, somebody did this wrong and you wanna, you wanna prove them wrong and you wanna do it better. Uh, and, and so just redoing something like that. Um, un unless that's your goal or replication per se is your goal, I would say, you know, rely on on existing work as much as possible and build on that with new things right there's really no point um, um, there is one point the, the point of replications is to increase our trust that uh, some particular piece of knowledge is um, valid or some particular result or, or theory or something is, is valid but the more data we have supporting something the more we can trust that the thing exists. The more studies we have documenting the um, effectiveness of the COVID vaccines, the more we trust that we should we should get them, right? If, if there's only one small study with very little data, maybe we trust it less than if it's you know, lots of studies uh, replicated many times over and so on. So there's, there's certainly value, uh, really high value in, in so doing this for the purpose of kind of um, increasing our confidence in, in some uh, theory or, or piece of knowledge. But other than that, I think pragmatically, you should you know, rely on existing stuff as much as you can and all, only do things uh, when there's a gap in knowledge that sort of seems important, right? So don't just do it for the sake of, of doing it. I also have a question. Oh, okay. I'm here, I'm just trying to like fix yeah. the zoom on my camera. So, when do we know that we have um, enough? So, so for example, ultimately, Jen uh, wants to answer the question that whether the fish eye view is, can improve the efficiency, right? Mm -hmm. But how do we know that we have enough, 
like research questions that related to this, and then finally we can prove that okay, this this thing is useful. Right. Because we can like always kind of bring up new research questions by using those kind of methods. But when do we know that we have enough questions? And this makes me make makes this work like kind of uh, like useful, right? Um, I guess the short answer is when your advisor tells you. The, the longer answer is yeah, I guess so it's a hard question to answer succinctly. Um, I would say the um, yeah, I would say this is just your um, your sense of um, so obviously you need at least some some studies you need at least some evaluations of something right some formal uh, evaluations of something uh, you know, um, at least one you need at least one you need at least one study evaluating something that sort of with a with a rigorous methodology that's appropriate for that particular uh, research question and so on with a sufficiently large sample size and sort of you know uh, covering uh, confounding factors and so on and so forth but you need you need at least one well designed study to show um, some convincing evidence that you know, something holds so um, the, the answer is at least one. Um, I don't know that there's a um, an, an upper bound really, right? You, you could keep doing this. You could try, you know, replicating it in different contexts on different populations. If you suspect that those things uh, have an impact and sort of refining your, your thing, your intervention, um, you could keep doing this. I think pragmatically, you know, at, at least one, right? You need, you need one solid piece of evidence that something um, works, it's useful, it's beneficial. Uh, before you can so move on to something else. I don't know if that's a very satisfying answer uh, though. Yeah, because like I was thinking from the kind of formal methods community, like really we kind of, if, you, if we are building a model, usually we will kind of provide a formal definition of a problem and we will kind of list all our assumptions and, and like in the best situation, we may have a proof from our premises to our kind of conclusion right but I, I i feel like like answering this um like the question like jen or uh like uh, we don't really have a clear like kind of bound of the of the context so i'm asking like when do we know that is enough i mean so i think the answer is it's never enough right so uh, knowledge can always be expanded this uh, in, in principle it's never enough i would say um but in practice, you know, it's enough once you've you've done one study that sort of shows that um, the thing you've built is useful for the target audience you intended it for. You know, that that seems like um, practically it seems like practically enough. But certainly, in principle, you could keep doing this. So I think um, you know you could you could spend probably your entire career doing this if if you so wanted to. So I guess I'm coming back to my earlier answer, at least one. A question I have with like kind of in the same line. Um, so with Jane's like big research question, um, she was making a lot of those, you know, assumptions that were not, you know, backed up by any type of research. And ultimately, you know, she'll want to still ask that bigger question. Um, and she might have answers to some of like some research backing up some of the assumptions, but ultimately she'll have to just leave some things as assumptions. Mm -hmm. um, is there, like, is it bad to assume many things um, just to kind of get to the point that you want to get to? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to say again, very pragmatically, I'm going to say, no, it's not bad to assume things. Um, it is however bad according to me, in my opinion, to not document your assumptions. That, that seems bad. Um, I think it's perfectly fine to assume things and sort of make progress on the thing that you 
can most immediately make progress on pragmatically. There's an opportunity to make progress on something um, in, in the short term. Um, even if you sort of haven't really addressed uh, the um, kind of validity of all of these assumptions that you make going in, that's perfectly fine. Even doing things out of order, like uh, sort of um, starting with something with lots of assumptions and then so going back and challenging some of those assumptions later uh, is, is also perfectly fine to me. Um, but I, I think the important thing here is sort of just documenting your assumptions, right? So like clearly um, scoping out the claims you're, you're trying to make so that you're not over claiming so that, you know, you at least you yourself understand the parameters of the claims you're making and the assumptions that you're making as you're making those claims. Is there any risk to, because something that I feel like I see happening sometimes is the initial paper will be very careful with the scope of its claims and it'll outline its assumptions. But then, you know, 10 years from now with papers that have, you know, cited this many times, eventually it just ends up being, this is, you know, a truth that we have in our community. Um, and so do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. And thanks. how we can avoid that? That's a great question. The other, I, I'm going to expand this a little bit. The other scenario in which you'll see this happen a lot um, is in uh, maybe popular media or, or press of sorts. Um, so uh, the, the, I don't know what the English term for this uh, game is, where you kind of, you, know, you, you say something to the next person and they say to the person next to them and so on. Um, what is that called in English? Uh, telephone. Telephone, thank you. Yeah, and and uh, it's it's sort of like this, right? So it's like this with science communication too. Um, I think, uh, well, actually, I, I was saving a couple of, uh, of uh, classes towards the the end of the semester to talk more about some some of these sort of human researcher biases that that creep up and are unavoidable. Um, so far, my cynic view is that these are unavoidable. The only thing we could do to um, I guess maybe reduce the negative impact of things like this um, is to um, sort of, I guess, essentially empathy, to put ourselves in the uh, shoes of our readers, if you will, and put ourselves in the shoes of hasty readers, if you will, uh, and sort of, you know. Once you've written this uh, this paper um, yeah, that has all of these very careful uh, claims and so on and, and parameters and, and things, um, step back and, and sort of look at it with fresh eyes, I don't know, later, or ask somebody else to look at it and to uh, ask uh, them to, to summarize the paper back to you. Like, what is the main result of that paper? And sort of see how well um, those uh, things in the fine print that you put in the fine print, how well those things get picked up on. Um, actually, so side note, this is the reason, I, I don't know if you've seen, I'm sure you've seen, um, I guess you've probably seen uh, many examples of reviews to your own papers. Um, I don't know if you've sort of written reviews yourself, but you see this, uh, that in, in peer reviews to academic uh, papers, um, reviewers are always asked to start their reviews with a summary of the paper. Um, the reason for that is to sort of uh, illustrate back, to communicate back to the authors how their uh, study was uh, potentially misinterpreted by reviewers um, and by readers, right? Um, it's, for us as writers, it's very hard to um, Kind of you know step back and, and and look at something with with foreign eyes, uh, and that's why it's sort of very useful to <clears throat> excuse me to have other people look at this and and sort of the peer reviewers are are filling that gap here. They're sort of telling you you know here's what I uh, what what I read your study to be about in in like two sentences. Here's what I think this was about, and so sort of see how well people there pick up on on the fine print. And I guess I guess if from this kind of exercise where you have somebody look at this. Um, you realize that um, that people don't pick up on the fine print at all, then you should just make it more prominent, uh, like literally, you know, using uh, typeface and, and things like that. Just make it more prominent or uh, like add it to more places in your paper and, and so on, right? So make it uh, clearer kind of uh, where you think your results apply and don't apply so that you make it harder for people to misread and misinterpret your paper. 
Does that make any sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Any more thoughts on this? I guess, so um, I'm gonna move on. We, um, like always, my time management is, is disastrous. Uh, we will not be able to get through all of the material I was planning today, because uh, I think we only have eight minutes left. Is that true? Okay, yeah, that, that is okay. We'll, uh, we'll um, you know, continue next time when I, when I see you. Just um, kind of a, a quick rehash of the discussion we had on Tuesday. Um, remember last lecture when we, we talked about positivism versus constructivism as sort of two very common philosophical worldviews in, in science in general. Um, and I guess the, um, the, the point of that was that you sort of have to uh, commit to one of these um, before you know what you're willing to accept as a valid answer to any research question. So like, what is, um, what would, what is Jane? What was Jane's worldview here? Was Jane a positivist or a constructivist? What, what do you think? Or I think it's a little tricky to classify because um, in terms of efficiency, it could be it could be interpreted in multiple ways. Um, you could take like a very numbers approach, and that would be like a positivist approach. But efficiency is also kind of like a human construct, like what what do we measure is efficiency. That could also be considered a constructivist view. Um, I think it really depends on how Jane wants to set up the problem um, in terms of like what, what she wants to measure. And then I think it would affect her view on um, picking either either side. Yeah, that was, that was a great answer. Thank you for this. I, I agree with everything except I think the, the, the directionality of your, of your argument there. I think it's always the, the worldview that comes first. And so that determines how you set up the, uh, the study and so on, how you look at the problem, not the other way around. You don't, you don't um, assume a worldview after you've sort of um, decided on your study design. It, it's usually the other way around, but I, I agree entirely with your answer here. And that was the point I was, uh, was gonna make as well. Um, so for example, positive as Jane um, would be Jane saying that um, controlled experiments, lab experiments, um, are the only source of trustworthy evidence when it comes to uh, proving that uh, the fisheye view navigator is more efficient. Um, the only way to sort of uh, get um, sufficiently trustworthy evidence for this is to manipulate uh, these things in a, in a lab control study, and then measure effects uh, there, kind of like with a medical trial. Uh, and uh, on, on the other hand, constructivist Jane could say that you know, lab experiments are useless because they ignore all of the messy complexity of, of real software projects and so on. And whatever you might be able to replicate in a lab is, is completely unrealistic and not representative of anything that might actually happen in, in reality. Uh, and therefore, none of that makes any sense. The only thing you should be doing is doing field work uh, to really sort of understand how these things uh, happen uh, in, in the field and so on. And then the judgments about improvements in, in efficiency to uh, improvements to file navigation efficiency, um, they are necessarily subjective. They, they, um, they're influenced by um, you know, context factors like distractions and so on and other things that might occur uh, in, in practice. And none of these things are things that you would be able to observe in an, a lab experiment because you're sort of controlling the environment yourself. All right, so you can see here how um, Essentially, right, you could uh, be looking at literally the same problem but with a very different lens uh, informed by this sort of worldview that, that, you, um, that you have. Um, right, so, and the point of this is that um, it's really impossible to avoid some commitment to a particular worldview uh, in, in any kind of science, really. Um, you cannot conduct research and certainly you cannot judge the results of research without some uh, criteria for judging what constitutes valid knowledge. And, and that um, means of committing to a particular uh, worldview. I think Bobo had this comment last uh, uh, lecture as well about, um, you know, can I um, use different methods or uh, uh, 
like I, I guess essentially which comes first is it your sort of commitment to a particular world worldview or is it your study design and choice of methods um, arguably it's so it's, you know, it's, it's always this commitment to uh, some worldview whether you do that deliberately and explicitly or, or implicitly um, you're, you, you've done that already. You, you have that sort of baked into your, um, your mind as you're doing research. And you sort of go into research, any research in, in any area with that worldview in mind. And that really shapes um, kind of how, how you look at things. Um, all right, yeah. So this was just to um, kind of, now that you've seen lots of uh, examples of research questions, this was again to kind of go back and and reflect on the kinds of questions that were asked uh, in, in the two papers we read about. I think we covered this already, so I'm going to skip this. Um, so we are very we have very little time left, but let's see. Let's take let's take one of these, uh, and we have a couple of minutes. Um, so here the question was: you know, Given these possible research questions, how would you approach? Uh, answering them in terms of methods, like what would you do uh, roughly as a, as a study design, given some of these questions? So let's let's pick one. Um, let's pick the first one. Like, why do engineers ignore security warnings in their code? Like, how would you approach answering this? What's a good method for doing this? I think it's probably good to use an interview because it's very over end the question. And I don't see a clear, uh, like an obvious or direct answer. So I need to collect all kinds of opinions from the developers. Right. So you want to build some theory for, for why this happens. Right? In general, the why type questions are uh, more amenable to qualitative methods. Um, what about something like which code review tool reveals more bugs? What would you do there? I think it's probably more quantitative one, qualitative one, like have a regression model, like to compare the, and even can do it in a, with a, some kind of a lab controlled experiment that have different developers use different uh, code review tools. And we have a mathematic model to uh, identify that whether there is a significant difference, significant difference in terms of their efficiency to uh, review bugs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so both of those make sense. So I guess just to to um, um, to summarize this part of, of today's lecture before um, um, we uh, we stop. Um, so two things that we talked about today, I think, are really um, important. One is the sort of how. Um, your commitment to some philosophical worldview, what you will accept as, as knowledge or truth or a valid answer to a, a research question, how that shapes um, the kinds of questions you're asking and the kinds of method you're choosing to uh, address them, and how even the research questions themselves, um, like irrespective of your, uh, your worldviews, perhaps there's a question that um, is amenable to both worldviews. You've seen the Jane example earlier. But the questions themselves kind of even abstracted away from the worldviews, uh, even those impact the choice of methods um, that are the best uh, applicable uh, for, for answering them. So I'll leave you with this. Uh, and we're going to talk about, um, we're going to talk about the role of theory uh, on, on Tuesday. Um, there's one, I'm going to ask you to, to write um, a blog post for next week and do some reading. Uh, so I'm going to send that uh, information uh, through Canvas or something. Um, just to confirm, are you all able to access Canvas and the Slack channel? And if you're not, you should let me know so I can fix that. I have not tried to access Canvas yet. <laughs> Okay, it'd be, it'd be good to try just to make sure that you have access to all the materials and so on. And maybe get me a like camera that focuses better too. Okay, this is really annoying. All right, th thanks everyone. I'll see you next uh, week on Tuesday. Thank you.